Yes, yes. Welcome to the ancient world of tabletop games. I am Agamemnon from the historical documentary Time Bandits. This is a report from a fugitive. With my modeling workshop in a much better state, I decided it was high time I made a start on almost nearly getting ready to approach beginning the consideration of possibly fixing the giant Waterdeep statue to a decent base. Most miniatures, even large ones, are made up of a special resin called procrastination, and that is a Warhammer fact. Altering a sturdy figure like this one is a fiddly process. At least the model is large enough for the modeler to spot mistakes quickly. Anyone who is all fingers and thumbs should be removed from the building prior to launch. If you are that person, remember Bruce Lee's words about water filling the cup and becoming the cup. The tricky part there is to pour the water into the cup. I had a hard enough time of it filling a large pot with water. Your cup must be a large pot, my friend. Straight out of the box, the model created a problem. Its legs were slightly warped and wouldn't fit easily onto the flimsy plastic base. I gave the model the warm water treatment and jostled the piece around until it was as the manufacturer intended. Yes, I know why the figure came with that flimsy plastic base. Dungeons and Dragons is associated with a particular range of miniatures, and they have transparent bases on larger models tied to size categories in the game. For reasons of stability, you'll find a few hefty creatures on massive bases, and those bases don't accurately reflect the creature's size category. A smaller circle appears on an oversized base to show actual game size. This is handy for use on map grids. I get it. But here, the sturdy model is mismatched to a flimsy base. Usually those transparent bases are glued to the plastic models. Here you have incredibly awkward pegs jutting up from the main base. This material is fragile. I went to great lengths not to shatter the base when making the previous video highlighting the problem. Even had the statue fitted the base perfectly right out of the box, I'd have remained weary transporting the damned thing around. With a pot large enough and plenty of warm water, finally, yes, it's true, the statue will fit onto that flimsy, fragile platform. Frankly, it's rubbish. The solution is to replace the base with a better one. Follow your rabbi's advice. Measure twice, cut once. I settled on a resin base by Dark Art Miniatures. The base I chose was 165 mm across at the widest point. Not quite long enough. Luckily, I had this base sitting on the table for other purposes. I used it to measure up the sort of platform I'd need for the giant statue, intending to buy a larger base, possibly even an oval wooden plinth sort of deal. However, I decided that this exact size of base would do. The giant's feet overlap the base, adding more dynamism to the pose, almost as though he is actually walking off that part of the landscape. Obviously, I wanted to create a new base for the statue. Even more obviously, I immediately put this task on a list of things to do and swept that list under the carpet. Here's a shot of the statue perched on the original base. You can make out pencil marks where another figure will go. That other figure is a war mammoth, since you ask. Positioning figures on large bases is vital. In the case of the statue, for ease of manipulation, I removed the sword and shield to see what I was doing. The statue stands on a flat surface without any base, but it's a tricky business keeping it steady. With a hefty resin base underneath it, I believed there'd be no great difference in balancing a statue, whether fully assembled or not. Luckily, I believed rightly. It's always nice when your blatant guesswork avoids disaster. Obviously, I tested the base with the statue, sword, and shield all in place, just to be sure. Blatant guesswork is one thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. If you are going to drill holes in models and bases and bears, oh my, then back your guesswork up with solid mad science experiments in the dark. Oh, and use a torch. Here are the two bases side by side. The original base is still set up for its true purpose, providing a stable platform for an undead war mammoth. Of course, I wouldn't fit a regular war mammoth to a large resin landscape. That's not how I roll. 
I'd be hard-pressed to fix that mammoth to the resin base with pins, so it's an epoxy resin job, glue only. The newer base for the giant statue faces the horror of drilling. These are connectors that hold up shelves on one of my many, 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 many bookcases, except that I took one shelf out to allow space for the really tall books. I thought a few connectors in the statue's feet would sit nicely enough and act as massive pins. The holes in the feet are hexagonal. I'll return to that point. In this shot, you see that the metal connector fits snugly in the hexagonal hole, but the hole is too shallow to take the connector in a stable way. I agonized over this. There are three pins on the original base. Two are long and one is short. How would I handle this mess? I knew I'd be drilling into the base. My idea was to stick with a hand drill and take things easy. Though that base is sturdier than the official one is, the material is still fragile if handled roughly, and drilling is a rough job. The statue itself is made of softer material. There's a fair bit of give in the plastic. Of the three hexagonal holes, only one hole really took a connector well. The big problem was the hole on the underside of the right foot at the front beneath the toe, very little room for manoeuvre there. I'd be making it up as I went along, that much I knew. This improvisation involved trying to fit metal to plastic and moving the assembly around the resin base to see what I could work with. Here's the statue perched on the base with metal connectors in place. It balances there just fine, even though I hadn't drilled any holes into the base by that point. Let's talk about the statue. I felt that I wouldn't need three pins to fix this monstrosity to the resin base. Two would do. My emergency measure, in the event that the three footholes sat comfortably over the base, was to take a hard piece of plastic from a sprue and improvise a support for the toe at the front of the shallowest hole. However I decided to tackle the project, I knew I'd be drilling soft plastic and hard resin. As the holes were hexagonal, I opted to wrestle with an Allen key. Running the key around the inside of the holes loosened up the plastic a little. I worked up Allen key sizes until the metal bit into the plastic. Here you can see a loose fit as an example. This Allen key idea was less drastic than starting with knives, files, clippers, dental tools, or a hand drill. Eventually I reached for a powered drill. Always start slowly and carefully, and then keep going slowly and carefully. After that I used specialist files of bizarre shapes, but didn't make too much headway. The hand drill was right out of the picture, as the largest bit for that was far too small for this job. Time to fire up the power tool. Just to make this clear, there were three holes in the statue's feet. One was too small for the metal connector and had to be drilled. Another was just about right and didn't need too much work. The third I'd leave well alone. When it came to powered alterations, the first electric drill bit was a shade too small, so I wasn't carving at the sides of the hole already there. Always work up in size to the drill that does the job. Less scope for errors that way. I took the opportunity to dig deeper into the material just to gain an idea of how easily I could mess up the statue. Main difficulties include slipping and drilling a hole through your knee, slipping and drilling a hole through the statue's knee, all of the above, and so on. I switched to another larger drill bit and cautiously carved out a space that the metal connector filled quite tightly close enough for government work. I drilled two out of the three holes and placed the metal connectors easily. The third hole I left. It was time to fix the large connector pins in place. I used two part epoxy glue and left the joints to cure for a whole day. Then I checked the results by testing out positioning on the resin base. That wasn't the resin base I'd use. I bought another and made new pencil marks on that for the statue. Yes, I'll get around to gluing that mammoth in place eventually. I'd avoided the tricky part for eternity. The new base arrived, and I toiled on it after more positioning checks. With the statue over the base, I worked out where the feet would go. The best bet seemed to be both feet overlapping the base. This would put the left side of this foot over the edge of an inclined area, and the right side of the foot barely resting on the level. And that solved the problem of how to deal with the shallow hole in the toe. No need to connect that to the base at all. This provided the dynamic feeling of walking off into the distance that I was looking for. The overlapping foot looks as if it is in mid-step. When in doubt, pencil things out. You're going to paint over the base anyway. I marked the positions roughly using the statue as its own stencil. 
With that rough guide out of the way, I held a metal connector against the base and drew more clearly around that. Then I reached for the hand drill and the largest bit that fitted inside. Drilling resin is tricky. You want a stable surface, good ventilation, great lighting, goggles, a mask, a Kevlar vest, a crash helmet, a roll cage, airbag, and dampened paper to wipe away the dust. That's if you use power tools. I found, when operating the hand drill, that the drilled debris would corkscrew up out of the hole in pasta formations. If I could get away with it, I'd create a guide hole for the power drill to dig into. The surface of the base is packed with detail, ridges, and you could easily skew off a ridge when starting your drilling with an electrical tool. So I tackled this the old-fashioned way first. If you're to make mistakes, make small ones with hand-powered tools. Brace the base, check the angle of the dangle, drill a little, get a spot of bite going, and take it slowly from there. Clear debris away so you can see whatever the hell it is that you're doing. I didn't want to fracture the resin base. If I shattered or cracked anything while drilling by hand, it was no go, and I'd have to rethink my approach. I'm not talking about the difficulty of drilling into resin. No, I'm talking about my inept twelve-fingered approach to tackling all dexterity-based assembly jobs. Drilling went well. With suitable depth achieved, I created my guide hole for the powered assault on the base. I switched over to the electric drill. This is just your basic do-it-yourself drill, available everywhere, nothing special. Safety off, finger off the trigger, check everything is stable, finger to the trigger, drill for a few seconds, just in case that was the point of disaster. But the resin took this pounding. I used the same size of drill bit as I'd used on the soft plastic in the statue's feet. No trouble. The difference, though, was clear. This was resin cut away at high speed. Plenty of powdery particles massing at the dig site. Mask up and protect your eyes. That residue is no joke. Use the amount of debris as a guide to how deep you're drilling. Gauge it. I employed a dentist-style modelling tool to remove the debris deep inside the dig site. These tools, the drill and the dental probe, are all from Army Painter tool sets. Hobby tools are much of a muchness. The Army Painter sets will do for most jobs. You'll find your way to specialist tools by arcane means and hidden paths. We all have the mass-produced tools the hobby industry sells, and we all have unusual gadgets that would be hard-pressed to describe. Use whatever's on sale. Don't forget to add your own improvised tools to the mix. It's that kind of hobby. I saw a shelf connector and decided I had the ideal tool for this job. Soon enough, and that's almost immediately, you'll want to stop drilling and check to see if it's all gone horribly wrong. Here's the electrically drilled hole leading to the manually drilled guide hole further in. I popped a metal connector in there for convenience. This showed how much more drilling I'd have to do. For reasons of filming, it's often useful to have a crypt on standby. This served as a platform, taking the resin base closer to the table camera. Also, for reasons of cameras, I did all the electrical drilling in another room. And for reasons of cloth, too. Bad enough that I unbox games on this table and punch out all the cardboard counters here as well. This leads to a blizzard of tiny cardboard particles that cover the table in artificial snow. From time to time, I vacuum the cloth to remove the tide of papery bits. But the tide soon rolls in again. I was safe. My camera was safe. The resin base was safe. I kept drilling, stopping frequently to clear out debris. Surprisingly, nothing turned to disaster. I'd test a connector again and then drill some more. This is not a hasty pursuit. Finally, I tried fitting the statue to the base. This worked surprisingly well. It stood up. Fine. Nothing cracked. I think the dividing edge in the middle of the connector worked wonders in keeping the whole assembly stable. It was so sturdy that I didn't need to glue it in place at all, if I didn't want to. Why would I? Well, to make sure the base didn't drop to the floor while moving the statue around. On the other hand, the metal connectors are glued into the flexible plastic. Plenty of give there. If a weakness exists, it exists in gluing the pins into the inflexible resin. I won't be in the habit of assembling and disassembling the model. Once it is painted and put together, it'll stand somewhere. When I say painted, I mean the base. I see no reason to add to the paint job in the statue. It's good enough. Here's a shot of the hand drill in the base. I carried the whole thing through to the video studio for filming. There's the pile of pasta tendrils, and the drill is stuck solid inside the hole it's made. I'm not supporting that by hand. 
The first drilled hole looks a lot neater once the guide hole is drilled out. Over at the second site, the guide hole dealt with the ridged surface details in the base not so bad. I considered that the place most likely to veer off from when drilling. That's why I drilled my hand first. And now a reminder of that awful plastic base. If you want to buy this statue and you knew it had this terrible base design, that might well put you off the purchase. Luckily for me, I had that resin base sitting there giving me ideas. I could experiment with it. The real experimentation came with the electric drill. I've had the dentist's drill cause less anxiety. With the holes drilled to the required depth and the statue carefully nudged into position, the assembly stands unsupported with ease. For a sense of scale, I've dropped a regular figure in there. The statue is so large that it threw off the uniform camera focus. Those large square flagstones of the dark art miniatures base provide your typical five foot battle space known to Dungeons and Dragons players the world over. Yes, this is clearly a display model on a display base, but it can and should be used in a game. And before that gaming event can happen, I must paint the base. Painting anything in the hobby causes a level of physical pain that lies beyond the realm of mere mortals, which is why it takes so long to paint anything. And that really is a model-making fact.